Um, I'd like to welcome everybody back to our virtual Eco Week. We'll give everyone a couple of moments to continue to join. And while we do that, I would like again to ask if you're comfortable, please use the chat feature to tell us where you're joining us from. While you're doing that, I want to remind everybody that this program is a partnership with the Cumberland County Improvement Authority and is a week-long virtual event featuring visits with local artists, live and pre-recorded programming from environmentally-minded organizations, and a daily kids' eco-camp each morning at 10 a.m. Please join us later today at 6 p.m. for Grow Native with Pamela Burton, who's joining us right now, and at 7 p.m., Exploring Your Watershed from Home, live with Sal Mangiafico, also of Rutgers um, Cooperative Extension. Tomorrow, Tuesday, August 18th, please join us at 10 a.m. for Kids Eco Camp Newspaper Baskets Live, Part 1. And then again at 6 p.m. tomorrow with Dr. Sam Moyer, who will be giving an artist demonstration about the process and craft of his broom. Right now, we are joined by Pamela Burton, who is going to speak to us about the Monarch Way Station, Way Station tagging at Rutgers Crawford Extension, but more on that in a little while. Before we get started, we want to make sure that you have a comfortable viewing experience. To that end, it is my pleasure to introduce Marcy Peterson, who will be handling all of our technical needs throughout the program. Marcy has been with Wheaton Arts since 1994. She's the IT director, and her undergraduate and graduate studies were in fine art, e-business, marketing, and public relations. Marcy, can you provide us with some tech tips before we get started with this webinar? I sure can, and it's great to be here, and it's great to be here with both you and Pam Burton, and I'm excited to see um, all about, learn about all the monarchs. Uh, this presentation is a Zoom webinar. You see the panelists. They, however, will not see you. You can ask the speaker questions through the Q&A feature. They'll try to answer your questions out loud, live. Um, the host, Pam, may also be able to answer your questions and will do so by typing a reply. You can also like other attendees' questions. Doing so helps us identify the most popular questions in case we run out of time. Click the thumbs up next to the comment. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the program for your technical and general questions. I'll also share some links and of further details and resources for you. You can also get a copy of the chat after the program. Just drop me an email and my email will be at the end of this presentation. Excuse me. Um, the session is being recorded. As this is a webinar, only the hosts and the panels will be heard and recorded. And to customize your experience, you can access this, your own settings in the upper left-hand um, part of your screen. So if you look up there now, you'll see a little icon, a green icon. And when you click on that, you'll be able to set some things um, and make some adjustments. For this particular webinar, all you'll need at this time may be to go to the attendees tab and maybe make your, make your chat box or your chat font a little bit larger. Otherwise, um, you should be fine and, and you don't need to do that at this time. Um, right now, I want to just mention a couple things about Wheaton Arts and the types of support that helps Wheaton Arts present programs like this, free programs like this. Um, that is membership, donations, and shopping at Wheaton Arts at shop.wheatonarts.org. If you want to learn a little bit more about how to support Wheaton Arts, you can contact Rhody Barron at rbarron at wheatonarts.org. And I just want to touch on membership a little bit. I'm not going to go through all the great details of, and benefits of being a member, but members do get it all. And member gift memberships are always available. And we have a special this week. We started this yesterday. And you can visit shop.wheatonarts.org and get 15% off of everything in your cart. And we're especially highlighting the pottery that is made at Wheaton Arts with wild clay, the local clay that is cultivated just one mile from, um, from the location of Wheaton Arts. And an added bonus this week is our partners, CCIA, as Pam mentioned, are providing eco bags, eco shopping bags to each and every shopper 
that visits our site and makes a purchase. So whether you're utilizing the curb, free curbside pickup or shipping to wherever in the continental US, um, you'll receive that free eco bag. So now I'd like to turn it back over to our host, Pamela Wakeman, and first a little bit about Pamela. Pamela is a ceramic artist, arts administrator, and educator. She's taught for Rowan University and for Wheaton Arts. You may have met her running the family activities on site at Wheaton Arts. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts at Rowan University and her Master's of Science at Drexel University. Her favorite thing about teaching and creating art is the challenge it presents to find new approaches to understanding and interpreting the world around us. And over to you, Pam. Thanks, Marcy, for that great introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us again for this program, during which we are hearing from Pam Burton about the monarch butterfly. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce Pam, but I do want to mention, um, if you're looking at the slides, you will have seen that our 50th anniversary icon or graphic is there at the bottom. Um, that is because we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, which is a really great milestone. Um, if you would like to see a slideshow of photos from the past 50 years, which is if you've been with the organization, it's pretty fun to kind of look back at the old photos. You can do so by clicking the link from the homepage of our website. So please, if you have a moment, do click on that and um, help reminisce with us about the great past 50 years that we've had. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce Pam Burton. Pam's love of nature began as a child. That love inspired her to attend Delaware Valley University for a BS degree in ornamental horticulture. Since then, she has served most of her career in the field of agriculture. Pam has been the Home Horticulturalist and Master Gardener Program Coordinator with Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Cumberland County since 2013. You can listen to Pam do a weekly series of radio spots on current horticulture-related topics on POP 99.9 FM, Power of Positivity. She also writes a seasonal newsletter. Pre-COVID-19, the Eco Fair at Wheaton Arts was one of the most significant projects undertaken by the Rutgers Master Gardeners of Cumberland County. Pam worked closely with the propagation team, the butterfly team, Ask a Master Gardener team, and Education Station team to make their contribution a success. She is pleased to bring a part of that to you as a virtual experience with two programs as monarchs and as natives. Thank you so much for joining us, Pam. I'm very excited to hear what you have to share with us this morning. Thank you, Pam. So let's get started here, mm -hmm. sharing my screen. Great. All right. You seeing it, guys? Yeah, it looks great. Perfect, perfect. So um, thanks for that wonderful introduction. As mentioned, I work at Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Cumberland County in New Jersey. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us for a little bit of Monarch Magic. Um, the sweet little girl that you see on the screen is actually a granddaughter of one of our Rutgers Master Gardeners of Cumberland County. And what does a home horticulturist do? I answer questions that homeowners have about their gardens and plants. I identify insects. And I'm also the Rutgers Master Gardener Program Coordinator. Here's a picture of the, of the Master Gardeners taken in front of the museum at Wheaton Arts from a previous eco fair. We like to provide um, research-based education to the public. We like to say that education is our product. So what you're gonna hear a lot about today are resources because there's no way you can cover everything about monarchs in an hour. And I certainly am not the top expert on it. Um, I was lucky enough to be asked to uh, join Wheaton Arts Eco Fair Virtual uh, because we also come with a native plant sale every year that is highly, highly popular. People run down the alleyway to get to it. <laughs> Uh, we talk a lot, we actually grow a lot of natives, which we're going to talk a little bit about later on. Um, also, if you want to join us tonight at six o'clock, I'm actually giving a presentation on growing natives. And I have to say with pride that um, the Master Gardeners propagation team actually grows all of these plants. So that's a huge undertaking. We really miss being with you guys this year. But of course, we usually are there with our magical interactive butterfly tent where everyone who enters turns into a kid yet again. 
Um, the only way we can do it this year is bring it to you virtually. So we're going to talk butterflies. I want to put a special thanks out to Monarch Watch. They allowed us permission to use their educational information and their excellent photographs for this presentation. And you'll see what I mean in a few minutes. Let's hope by the time that we're done with this whole thing, you'll consider being one of their citizen scientists too. So let's just imagine for one moment that we are a mama butterfly looking for the perfect habitat to lay her eggs. And Marcy is gonna give you a link in the chat box now on how to contact uh, Monarch Watch. Would it be here? Maybe. Or do you think she might like this habitat just a little better? Well, what do we think she's looking for? Ah, it's yeah. all, yeah. Um, I'm not seeing your slide move. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. I'm okay. going to run through that really quick to get you. Thanks, Marcy, for letting me know. I'm looking at an entirely different screen, as you can tell. Okay, here we go. Monarch Watch. And... She's looking for a number of things, but the most important thing is milkweed of the genus Asclepius. Monarchs are known as specialists, and their caterpillars can only eat plants in the milkweed family. They can't host on or digest any other plant materials, so it's imperative that she has to find that milkweed. Milkweed are perennials. They like full sun and good drainage, and you're probably familiar with a common milkweed, which admittedly at this time of the year becomes a bit messy and you may not want that in your home garden. The good news is there are over 100 species of milkweed in North America, which have beautiful flowers and aren't quite as messy. There's two that you see on this screen alone. Uh, Pam, why is it called milkweed? Ah, the milk part of the common name comes from the ooey, gooey, sticky sap that oozes when the plant is cut. It reminds me a lot of Elmer's glue. Unfortunately, the common name also has the word weed in it. And that's what people think then, that, it, that it's a weed, but it's absolutely critical for monarchs. Now, I've planted some of these in my garden, but mm -hmm. what is the best way to approach it? Should I be planting from seed or should I use a, a plant and transplant it in? Well, I don't wanna set you up for failure. Milkweed is actually very hard to grow from seed. It requires stratification. It doesn't always germinate easily, but if you want to give it a try, Marcy will add a few links into the chat box for the locations of where you can go on websites and find uh, seeds to buy. Okay, now I was lucky enough that my local nursery had some milkweed plants, but if, if people aren't like me and are not as lucky, um, where would they be able to purchase milkweed plants? Oh, there's two really great sources, and, and you know, we would always bring them uh, to the Eco Fair as well, but there's two online sources, um, and it just depends on which one works better for you. One of them is called the Native Plant Finder, and it lists suppliers by zip code, um, so it's interactive. And the other one, and this is the one I happen to like, is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and Marcy can add those links onto the chat box. Great. Thank you. So we, we did talk a little bit about the specialization um, and, and why that's so, so important uh, for the, the monarchs. Milkweed itself has poisonous cardinalides, which can be ingested by monarchs, but they're poisonous to vertebrates. The chemicals stay with the monarchs throughout their entire life cycle. Of course, being poisonous doesn't help the monarchs much after a predator has already killed or tried to eat them. Hmm. How does the monarch let the predators know that they are poisonous? Ah, nature's wonderful. Monarchs <laughs> use their war warning colors of yellow, orange, black, and white to let potential predators know that they contain poisonous chemicals. It's not unusual to see butterflies with beak-sized sections gone from their wings where a predator took a bite out of the adult, tasted the poison, and re released the butterfly without killing it, and no doubt learned its lesson never to try that again. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a fun part of milkweed because that's so essential for the monarchs. Um, 
tell you a little bit about a fluff and stuff story. In the summer 2013, spring 2014, Journal of Undergraduate Research, a person by the name of Julia Nerang wrote a long article on the potential of milkweed floss as a natural fiber in the textile industry. And Marcy can put the link on for the full article that can be found. But I'm going to read you just a little bit of what she, she says about the milkweed fluff use. In quotes, my initial research led me to find that the fluff has actually served several little known purposes. During World War II, the Japanese cut off the United States supply to a fiber called Kapok. Without Kapok, they did not have any stuffing for life jackets. Subsequently, the government launched a program that enlisted the help of children. If they could fill up a large onion bag of milkweed fluff, they would receive 15 cents. This incentive proved very popular, and the United States was able to stuff over 1.2 million life vests with milkweed fluff. That's some pretty cool stuff. And it's cool. Yeah. So let's, let's take a, a look at the anatomy. Um, Marcy, are you ready to put a, a poll question out to our, our audience? All right, while Marcy does that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy and why we're waiting for those results. So you see that um, on, an, on an adult, they have a head with eyes, antenna, poppy, and proboscis. And the poll question itself is, what part of its body does a monarch use to taste? The antennae and palpa, the tongue-like proboscis, or its feet, which are called tarsus. The palpi are actually at the end of the antenna. They sense molecules in the air, giving butterflies their sense of smell. The butterfly's tongue is a long proboscis, and it uses it like a straw to suck up nectar and water for nourishment, and it curls up when it's not in use. So do we have the poll results? Can we see them now? Yes, we can. Okay, and what, what, did they, what do people think? Oh, there we go. Oh, wow, <laughs> we have some smart people in our audience. Excellent. On the thorax, there's six legs with tarsus at the end for gripping and for tasting sweet liquids. I think maybe some of you visited our butterfly tent in years past, huh? That is pretty cool. So how does the monarch know that it's on a milkweed plant as opposed to a different type of plant? Uh, the females take their legs and they drum it against the plant, which releases plant juices and special chemoreceptors to let the butterfly know if it's the correct host plant. She'll test that plant with all six legs just to make sure before she lays her eggs because she knows that it's so very important and essential for the egg survival to be laid on the monarch or on the milkweed so that when they, they um, come out of their egg, they can start eating right away. Mm. There's two pairs of wings, two hind wings, and two forewings also on the thorax. So take a look at those veins, and they, they're going to give the wings structure, strength, and support. But this is also the way that we tell the difference between the male and the female by looking at those veins. On the male, there's thin vein pigmentation and swollen pouches, and that's the giveaway on the hind wing. The female monarch has thicker vein pigmentation and no hind wing pouches. Now there's also abdomen, but that's hidden in this picture between the hind wings. So butterflies go through a complete metamorphosis. That means that there's four distinct stages. So let's count them off with me. One, egg. Two, larva or caterpillar. Three, pupa, also called chrysalis in this case. Four, adult, which is the butterfly. From egg to adult, it takes about 30 days. Monarchs usually lay a single egg on a plant, and it's often on the bottom of a leaf near the top of the plant. Pam, about how many eggs does a female lay per year? Well, there's not specific statistics on that, but it's believed that it's probably anywhere from 100 to 300 eggs. Wow. Yeah. 
The eggs hatch after about four days after they're laid. And I have to tell you that the size of that egg is 1.2 millimeters high and 0.9 millimeters wide. So you can imagine how much that picture of the close-up yeah. is, is in, enlarged. And for anyone who's not sure of what that is, here's a ruler. You can get your rulers out and check it later on. And another little visual is it's about the size of a pinhead. So that's pretty, pretty small. Uh, I also wanted Marcy to put on the screen for you guys a really great resource and reference. There are some wonderful pictures and wonderful uh, videos on a link from MarylandMonarchConservation.org. And so Marcy can um, provide you guys with that too. So the larvae come out of the egg. Lucky larvae, their number one job is to eat and grow. They start out by eating their eggshell, and then moving on to the milkweed. When they start getting a bit big for their britches, they shed the old skin, which is called molting. And again, they often eat that before going back to munching lunch on milkweed. There's five instars that grow from 1 16th inch all the way up to one and a half inches. And again, get your rulers out. That is a lot of eating and growing in just 10 to 14 days. The first, second, and third instar don't chew all the way through the leaf. They only feed on a few of the layers, and that's called trenching. The fourth instar gets a bit bolder and chews out a circular area in the milkweed leaves, which helps reduce the amount of sticky sap that flows as the larva feeds. The fifth instar might chew a notch in the leaf's petiole, or stem, causing the leaf to hang down before they quickly consume the entire leaf. This is called flagging. I went outside in our pollinator garden first thing this morning to see if I could find some actual caterpillars for you, and I couldn't find any, or I was gonna bring one in and we were gonna have a friend during this presentation, but, and the monarch butterfly flew away. I couldn't grab it. So you can tell when they're ready to pupate when the monarch caterpillar gets into the pre-pupil J formation. Then they straighten out just a little bit and they start splitting open. Look at that. Oh, wow. Until the green cuticle of the pupa is exposed. Again, thank you, Monarch Watch, for those wonderful, wonderful photographs. I did not have anything like that in my own um, pictures. So, you know, that's, that's thanks to them that we've, we've got these to look at. So the life cycle of the chrysalis is uh, about 10 to 14 days. And as soon as the monarch actually comes into this chrysalis, it does a little wiggle dance. So you can do a wiggle dance at home if you want <laughs> to make sure that it's very, very well attached. And the, this, this stage of the life cycle is actually the riskiest. It's got absolutely no defenses at this point. So many times the caterpillar leaves the milkweed patch to increase the size of the predation search and not make themselves easy targets. So Pam, do we have any chat questions that I need to tend to? Actually, yes, we do. Thank you so okay. much. So somebody wa someone wants to know, how do people know if the butterfly is poisonous? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question, and I don't really know, except for education, 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 uh, and realizing that, um, you know, that monarchs are poisonous. Um, that's the best way I can tell you. I don't think we're going to try and eat them. <laughs> so at now, least Yeah, exactly. They're not poisonous, right, to us if they are near us or touch us, but it's the ingestion of the butterfly, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. It's the actual yep. eating of the butterfly. <laughs> so I don't recommend Which we that. we do not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> no. That was a great and question. I, it was a good question. I'll also <laughs> tell you that there are some caterpillars out there um, that you don't want to touch. So if you don't know, don't try it. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have little hairs that actually you can have a very negative reaction to, and they might even kind of sting you a little bit too. And that's one of their 
predation um, things that that nature mother nature has provided to them Great. anything else nope that's all for right now all right okay so when the butterfly is ready to emerge the pupa is very dark and orange and you can actually see the black adult wings if you look closely there through the pupa covering and the monarch comes out it clings to its chrysalis and it looks kind of weird at first with wrinkled wings and a large abdomen but the butterfly pulses its abdomen and pumps fluid into the wings until they are fully expanded and stiff it takes about one to two hours and if you are so lucky to be able to see this event happen it is a wonderful wonderful time to pull your cell phone out and take some great pictures all right, we're back to the beginning again. And we see the monarchs and we see their caterpillars on a milkweed. The summer gem generations live about two to five weeks, but the late summer and early fall monarchs look and act the same, but they're really very different. Um, how are they different? Ah, uh, those are the ones that will do the monarch migration. This generation flies one to 3,000 miles and overwinters until the following spring when they return and fly back again. And the flight is down to Mexico. It's really important for them to have nectar sources to be able to store fat to fuel their long journey ahead. And it's this generation that Monarch Watch wants to be tagged for more educational study and research. So the November to September pathway that the monarchs take was determined by studying recoveries and observations of the tagged migrating monarchs. And Marcy's gonna put a poll question up there. How do the monarchs know it's time to migrate to Mexico? A, the seasonal change of shorter days. B, the seasonal change of cooler temperatures. C, they look at a calendar and see it's fall. Or D, both A and B. So the monarchs, and I'll talk a little bit about this migration while uh, Marcy gets that poll up and gets the results in. The monarchs of North America are the only butterflies to make such a long two-way migration every year. They fly in masses to the same winter roofs. Can you just imagine what that might look like to see that going by? Science doesn't have all of the answers. And one of the unsolved mysteries remains as to how they find the overwintering sites. They often return to the exact roosting trees. Now remember, those trees were used by their great, great grandparents the previous spring. So that's kind of magical and mysterious. And what are our poll results? Pam, I'm sorry, but the second question is not coming up for some reason. Let me try it one more time. Okay. And let's see, because I'm only getting the first one. Here's the second one. There we go. Thank you for waiting. Okay, everybody can answer now. Okay, and while we're waiting for that result, I'll move to the next um, slide and talk a little bit about this, and then we'll, we'll go back and talk about the results there. The Monarch Watch Tagging Program is a large-scale citizen science project. It was initiated in 1992 to help understand the dynamics of the monarch's spectacular fall migration through mark and recapture. How many tags are distributed in one year? Well, each fall, more than a quarter of a million tags are distributed to thousands of volunteer citizen scientists across North America who tag the monarchs as they migrate through their area. I have tags, and I'll show you what they look like, but it's not the right time of year in our area. So I'll wait until September, and if you go on to monarchwatch.org, they will give you an interactive uh, way to find out when is the best time. So this is what the tags look like. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and they're, they're tiny, you know? Like, right, well, yeah, they, I would just, yeah, they would have to be yeah, really small for them. They, you know? So, which makes them a little challenging to use, so especially with clumsy fingers. So they recommend taking them off with a tooth, toothpick because you don't mm -hmm. want to touch the sticky stuff. Mm -hmm. And do you want to st check those poll numbers now? I do. Okay. 
Can you ah, see the results? Yeah. We had just had the smartest audience going on. Both A and B is correct. Yeah, that was pretty, pretty silly for me to think they might look at a calendar, right? <laughs> so. Congratulations all. Yes, congratulations all. So how do you tag a monarch? Well, first of all, you have to record the data that's on, on the tag. And you can download this, or you can actually do it online. Monarch Watch prefers that you submit it online. I downloaded it for today's presentation so you can see what it actually looks like. And um, the tags are an alphanumeric code. It's unique for each butterfly and each year. So, so Kim, how is, how is this process done on a live monarch? Well, you carefully, carefully hold the monarch between your thumb and index finger along the leading edge of the butterfly's forewing. And we identify that in this picture. Closer to the bo body, not at the tip. And you locate what is called a discal cell. It's the large mitten-shaped cell on the hind wings. And if I was able to catch that monarch this morning, I would have showed it to you, but it was craftier than I was. That's where the tag goes which puts it really close to the center of lift mm -hmm. and gravity for the butterfly so it does not interfere with their flight. Again, you remove the tag from the backing using a toothpick, place it over the discal cell, and position the pads of your thumb and forefinger on both sides and press firmly for two seconds. And then you release the butterfly. Most of the recovered tags are obtained from overwintering sites in Central, or Central Mexico, where Monarch Watch buys back the recovered tags from guides and community members. So, Mama Monarch can't read the sign, but somehow she finds her way into our wonderful pollinator garden, which was recently qualified as a Monarch Way Station. And what so, is required to qualify as a Monarch Way Station? Ah, well, Monarch Watch likes you to have at least 100 square feet, but that doesn't have to be all in one spot. It can be split among several sites in your landscaping, and I'll talk about how to do that soon. There wants to be a lot of sun. Butterflies, Monarch butterflies love full sun, so it just stands to reason that you're going to pick plants that, have, that like full sun too, which is about six hours a day. They also would like most of the plants that we're going to talk about like good drainage as well. Absolutely has to have the host plant of milkweed plants. Ideally 10, and maybe with two or more species, so they might bloom at different times, and that way the monarchs will stay in your, um, your monarch watch station longer. But they need food to eat too. Um, they're called nectar plants. And I'll give some examples of those again later on, but the idea is you want to plant for continuous bloom throughout the season. They also would like some shelter, so it's recommended to group the plants fairly close together without crowding them, and they like some shelter from predators and the elements. So if you mix uh, milkweed and nectar plants close together, they'll actually be able to um, eat the milkweed and feed on the nectar flowers as well. Funny thing is, monarchs like mud puddles. So it's great if you can create wet, sandy, or muddy spots for butterflies to get salts and other nutrients. They call this puddling, um, and I like mud puddles too. If you want to uh, put some dark stones or tiles out for them to perch on for and, on cool mornings, that adds some activity to your garden. And it's also important, if you're gonna commit to doing this, to be reasonable, don't start too large, um, make sure you've got a plan in place for all of the things of taking care of a garden, which can include mulching and thinning and fertilizing and amending the soil, etc. So, you know, we ask our question, our, our, the question, will it really make a difference? So I have kind of a tricky poll question for you here. How many monarch adults do you think can be produced in a single season in a 15 by 15 foot garden? located in the center of Dover, Delaware, just by including Asclepias siraca plants. So Marcy will put that up on the poll for us, and you have a choice of 25, 150, or 75. And Marcy will also provide the link again to the monarchwatch.org. So let's the, see. The polling is in place. The polling is in place. 
All right, while, while the polling is being handled, um, I'm gonna switch down to the next slide and talk about that just a little bit. So how do we get, how do, yeah. Yeah, how do, how do we get started on, on this? Ah, good question. Again, we spoke a little bit about the full sun and the good drainage, but since we're not just talking to people in Cumberland County, which is what I'm used to, um, you do wanna go on to the plant hardiness zone map and Marcy can provide that link to you. Um, and you, you wanna find out what zone you live in because that's important for picking out uh, your plants to make sure that they're hardy in the, the zone that you live in. You also wanna get your soil tested. And for us, the land grant university is Rutgers and she can provide that link to you. If you're from another state, um, contact your local cooperative extension office and they can help you figure out how to get the, um, your soil tested. And what happens is it comes back with an analysis of whether you need to add lime and what you need to do right now for fertilization and what you might need to do six months from now. So let's go back to that previous slide. What are our poll results? Do we have those, Marcy? Yes, here they are. Oh, oh, wow, you guys rocked it. Maybe because I told you it was tricky. Yeah, <laughs> so there's a quote from the book um, that's called The Living Landscape, Designing for Beauty and Biodiversity in the Home Garden. It's written by Rick Dark and Doug Talame. It was put out by Timber Press in 2014, and you are absolutely correct. One small 15 by 15 foot garden in a courtyard in the center of Dover, Delaware, produced 150 monarch adults in a single season by including several Asclepias siraca plants as one of its species. So can you make a difference? I would certainly say they did. We just talked about that other slide, so I'm gonna move on to um, maybe how you guys can get started in doing this. Most landscaping, in the home has some spot where a small garden can be added, maybe just by reducing some of the lawn that you have. And I like this idea of linking two shrubs together. It also helps avoid the kerplunk look. Um, mm -hmm. Within this, it, and this is from North Carolina State University, and Marcy will give you the link for that so that you can go back and look at it a little closer if you'd like. Uh, they include short, medium, and tall layers. They also suggest clustering the flowers closer together. We talked a bit about that, which helps with the shelter and seasonal blooms. So many times I see people with two uh, bushes or two trees in their front yard, and this just kind of helps link it together and it would give you a wonderful, wonderful little pollinator or monarch way station. This is an actual garden design example of a monarch way station. I would love to see this planted in a small pocket where you can see it from a window while you're having your morning coffee. And I'll be showing you some of the plants listed here later on. And Marcy can provide the link for you uh, so that you can go and study this a little bit closer at your leisure. And here's a third option. How about a corner of your yard or along a fence line? This is a really cool, um, possibility and I, I have a hedgerow that I have a very large pollinator garden growing against and that's what reminded me of this. And then again, this, this also could be shown along a fence. This is from University of Maryland and um, it's just kind of a fun little uh, rendering of a possibility of a garden. Again, you don't have to start that big. Uh, make sure that, you know, um, when when we start carting the kids off to soccer again, that you've got time to uh, tend the garden and weed it and stuff. So you don't need to get huge to begin with, but I guarantee you're gonna get hooked. So let's talk a little bit about the nectar plants. Ah, here we come for some pretty, pretty, pretty plants. We talked about the importance of the host plant, the Asclepias or milkweed, but the butterflies need nectar plants for food as well. So we're going to talk, look at some of the nectar plants that were listed earlier in uh, the garden examples. But Pam, I'll ask you, do we have any questions that we need to talk about now in the chat box? Um, so we had one question um, about the milkweed, and you touched on a little bit. Um, someone was asking, why is 
planting seeds for milkweed so difficult? Could you share that again? Sure. Um, it's difficult because they need stratification. And that is sometimes a hard concept for um, people to know for how long and how to do it. Um, I've tried just going ahead and it, it's hard for those seeds to make it through a winter. And the stratification part of it that milkweed needs is actually the cold. Um, you know, so you can try putting it in your refrigerator, um, but you would really need to do a lot of research on that and figure out how to make it work. It certainly is less expensive that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rutgers um, Master Gardeners have been highly successful because they have done the research, they have done the stratification, and, you know, we were able to grow several different species to bring it to the eco fair in person. So good question. Thank you. Thank you. Give it a try. You know, what have you got to lose? <laughs> uh, Monarch Watch itself has a list of plants for butterfly and pollinator gardens, native and non-native plants suitable for gardens in the northeastern United States, and they were so kind as to bold the must-haves. So Marcy can give you the link for that. But we're going to start talking with talking about a coneflower. A coneflower is also Echinacea. And yes, I do have the Latin names in here. That's very important to know when you go to a garden center because the common names can be very confusing. And they might use coneflower for something else as well when you really want the Echinacea um, here. So if at the top of the flower, it does become a prickly cone, and it's kind of hard to touch. And so I think that's probably why it came up with cone flower as its common name. It's a perennial, and it is a native. It grows three to four feet tall, so this one would go in the back of the garden. And it's very drought tolerant once it's established. It can grow in full sun to partial shade. So, you know, this is a really good plant to pick because you don't have to worry about going out and watering it right right now. Well, we've had a pretty wet summer, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you really wouldn't have to worry about getting out there and watering it. This pretty flower is called yarrow, and it's pretty in pink. That's why I put it up here. It comes in other colors too. It again is a perennial. It looks beautiful as a cut flower, and it has really, really lacy-like leaves, so it just looks really pretty. I yeah, like to... Will these milkweed plants and nectar plants survive New Jersey winters? Yes, yes. I have all of these plants that I'm showing you today are out either in the pollinator garden here or I have them in my own personal garden. Okay. Good question. Holly Hawks I put in because this is one of the old fashioned favorites and it's making a great comeback. It's really tall again, it's four to eight feet tall. I love these colors, and when the breeze comes up, the hollyhocks look like they're dancing. <laughs> you want to put it in the back of the bed, and they readily recede themselves for year after year happiness and joy. They remind me of my grandma. Now, um, Pam, I have a question about those. I'm actually sitting here with some seeds, and um, I know I've seen snapdragons and lupine, which look really similar to hollyhocks. Are, are right. they just as good? Um, snapdragons are an annual. Hollyhocks, it depends on what site you look at. Some call them um, biennial, which means they, they come up every other year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to call them a hardy annual because they reseed themselves for year after year after year. And the lupine, if I'm correct, and I could be wrong, I believe lupine are perennials. Are they just as good? I'll tell you what. You know, I see butterflies out there on a lot of flowers, it might be harder for them to get on flowers that are, are double um, mm. to get the proboscis in there. But, you know, there really isn't any um, wrong flower for a butterfly to get nectar off of. So, and, and I put these up here because they're given in the examples and because I do know, know that they can grow here. Great. Give them a try. The funny thing is with gardens, I think people are sometimes hard, they, they have a hard time getting started because, you know, we're, we're so used to um, having gone through school and, and getting graded. Nobody's mm -hmm. grading you on your garden. You know, it's all for you. It's all joy. And if you get one butterfly in there, guess what? You passed. You get an A. <laughs> 
So when we're talking about nectar plants, it's, it's not just about monarchs. So um, take a look at this, and you can actually see an adult black swallowtail, butterfly, and caterpillar. Um, the, the adult is not on the dill. It's actually on, um, I think that's liatris. But, you know, it, you're going to have an added bonus when you plant the dill because it's, they're not just nectar for uh, butterflies. You're going to actually be able to have the black swallowtail butterfly caterpillars come along. And I warn you, they like to eat a lot too. So I plant a lot of dill and I plant a lot of parsley um, just to make sure that they get their food too. And so do I. A must have. This is one that I would highly recommend and it's the absolute must because these are fall blooming, mm. late summer fall blooming asters. And that's really important. Remember I talked about what the migrating monarchs might um, have some nectar sources of in the fall. Uh, you know, fall is not just about reds and yellows and oranges. Uh, mix a little purple in there too. Um, these are perennial. They're native. And uh, for anybody out there, who, because we have a very well-educated audience here, for anyone one out there who's going, but wait a second, they get really tall and unruly by the end of the summer. They do, but here's the key. Give them a haircut on Memorial Day, just whack them down to half, and then again on 4th of July, and you're going to find that you have a lot more blooms, and they're going to be uh, very manageable and not get wrangly and out of control. Now, how tall do they actually grow? If, if you let them grow um, without whacking them back, they can get like four foot tall. So should we plan to plant these kind of mid to back of the garden? Yeah, um, I actually, because I give mine a haircut on Memorial Day and the 4th of July, um, I can keep mine more at a medium height. But you have to remember to do that, you know, like right. you know, in, in amongst all the picnics, <laughs> you have yeah. to remember to go out and take care of that. Yeah. So, you know, you can give all of your guests, um, hopefully we can uh, congregate again next year and you can give all of your, your guests some pruning shears and say, yeah. here, have a look. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, you know what? Lucky for us, the Sclepius does double duty as a nectar source too. And again, it is native and perennial, and the butterfly weed has that beautiful showy orange flower. Ours are in bloom in the garden right now. This is a perennial with cool blue flowers. And when I say it makes me feel cool, I mean, you know, not like cool, but as in not too warm. Just because it's just got, it, it just kind of washes over you when you're, you know, out. I have it right outside my um, side porch. When it gets done flowering, that's really fun for me because the wonderful seed pods make a really cool sound when they knock together. So this time of the year, I can be sitting on my side porch and I kind of hear them clicking together. So it's, that's just a fun sound. Ah, this is Queen Anne's Lace. And you're going, what? Isn't that a weed? <laughs> You know what? <laughs> it may be a weed to, to some of us. It's actually the wild carrot, and it doesn't know it's a weed, and the insects and pollinators that go to it doesn't know it's a weed. So I happily have it growing in amongst my uh, flowers in my yard. This is the Eastern Joe Pie weed. This is another wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, plant that I would highly recommend. And my journey through the garden this morning, I saw the monarch on the Joe Pye weed. Joe Pye weed is really tall. It goes way to the back of the garden. I'm talking like six feet tall. And, you know, that's, that's where the monarch was this morning. It's a really great native choice instead of the butterfly bush. The butterfly bush, I know everybody's going, but I love the butterfly bush. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's great, and I'm glad you do, but if you want to plant natives, this is a wonderful, wonderful native um, choice uh, to plant if you are committed to the natives. There are over 36 caterpillar species that feed on the Joe Pye weed. And also, um, the, the spice bush swallowtail is one of them, 
and you wonder to yourself, well, why is it called the spice bush swallowtail? Because we all love looking at butterflies. You know, the cool thing is you're not going to get just monarchs. You're going to get others. Well, it's called that because the spice bush or the lender of buns wine is the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. So that's pretty cool stuff. And again, if you attend my six o'clock uh, presentation tonight, you'll learn more about the natives themselves. Pam, should people be concerned if they have pets um, that go into their garden or chickens or anything like that that might be amongst these plants? Um, Are they poisonous? Will they harm the, the pets? Some of them might be. Um, I can't tell you which ones offhand. I haven't done the research on that. Uh, you know, a lot of times, at least I find in a lot of the New Jersey gardens um, from the master gardeners that I've heard about, they actually try specifically to keep their pets out of the garden. Um, and it's maybe not as much of a pet control as a pest control mm. because of all of the, you know, um, critters we have that like to go in and avail themselves of our gardens as well. Sure. So, <laughs> you know, um, you know, especially like groundhogs, you know, um, the raccoons, the squirrels, they, they just think they, hey, ha ha happy us, look, this, this person's <laughs> in the <this> garden. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the blanket flower. Um, I would suggest to people that if you're concerned about that and you really want to know what the um, poisonous ones are, you can always look in the, the poison control center, um, dial them up, or do your research and check it out. I only use websites that are .edu. That means that they're scientific research-based. So that's important to realize because, you know, despite everybody's thought process, maybe not everything that we find out there on the internet is true. So the common uh, name blanket flower may have come from the ability of this wild species to completely cover the ground with a blanket of color. And it is very pretty. It's, this one is not a tall grower. This would go in the front of the garden and, um, you know, just a beautiful addition. It's nice to mix it up with some annuals. This is always one of the first plants that we sell out of at the in-person eco fair. It's a spring bloomer, so some of them are in bloom, um, and that has a lot to do with what people are buying right then, and it works really well in a container garden, too. So this is bee balm, and hey, Pam, what did your son say about this flower? Yeah, so we've had bee balm growing in our garden for quite some time, and my son thought it was really funny because he said it looks like it's wearing a crown on top of the plant. So I thought that was really sweet. <laughs> I did too, and I, I, I thought that that amount of imagination, um, I would never have thought that, but now every time I see that, I'll think of him. <laughs> <laughs> this is a black-eyed Susan. And some of us might be familiar with this because they, are, they readily grow everywhere. Um, the common name is likely attributed to the black center, which stands out in the middle of the bright yellow petals. This also makes a beautiful cut flower. My background is actually in ornamental horticulture. And I, um, in the past, have worked as a floral design in several different shops. So I always have fresh flowers in my house in some way, shape, or form. And uh, these definitely, they make the list. And I'll, and I'll note too, I have those in my garden. And um, if people are concerned about kind of planting on a budget, those are really great that I've noticed yeah. because you can pull up a little section of them and plant them somewhere else. And then mm -hmm. they'll start to, to spread there as well. So you can really fill your garden over the years with just starting with one plant. You can, Pam. And, you know, it's, it's fun to do that. I have... Um, I'm fortunate that uh, uh, some of the master gardeners have shared some of their plants with me at some plant swaps that we've had in the past. So when I walk through my gardens at home, and I will admit to all of you that I have a lot of garden space, but that's my happy place. Um, you know, I, I can look to these plants and, and, you know, my friends gave them to me. So it yeah, just, it, it's, it's a great place to be. So the last uh, plant I'm going to talk to you about is goldenrod. And again, you're going, wait a minute, that's a weed. And I'm asking you to do just a little bit of a paradigm shift in your thought process, because this is not the plant that causes those allergies. 
goldenrod is coming to its own spotlight. You can find actually when when the flower market was open in New York City, you can actually go in and find goldenrod being sold at the flower market and it's going for a decent price. I sail a lot and I've seen it in native plantings all along the harbors of the Chesapeake. The culprit is actually the ragweed, which is not showy at all, but blooms at the same time. So we notice the goldenrod because of the beautiful showy flowers. They have really sticky pollen that adheres to the insects. And the uh, ragweed actually depends on wind pollination. So the ragweed is putting the pollination out to the wind and that's what you're breathing in and that's what's giving you allergies. This wonderful little plant here supports about 94 species of caterpillars. It's used by four species of insects as food source or host plants and the fall flower attracts many native pollinators including butterflies. Maybe not this butterfly. Oh. So is there any questions that we have to answer? We've got about five minutes here. So there's no more questions coming from the chat, but if anybody has some last minute questions, please do um, ask them in either the question and answer, or I'm also looking in the chat for your questions. Um, okay. Pam, this has been so informative, and my garden definitely has a lot of the pollinator plants, and I have planted some milkweed, but you have absolutely inspired me to plant oh, more. And I'm going to definitely go through back through your slides, and we're going to have this recording available for those who want to review it again. Good. And I'm definitely making a list and, and going to plant some more plants. Oh, that makes me feel good. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. And, um, you know, when, when, when we can meet again, I will bring you some plants and you can have some of my plants in your garden, too. That sounds amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about the resources that the slide that you have on here. Okay. Um, I actually, I used a lot of these resources for the entire slide presentation. So I'm giving them their due here on this slide. Um, you know, we've got uh, the Monarch Watch. There's also the New Jersey Audubon Society. Uh, Pat and Clay Sutton, if you're from uh, down Jersey, you know of them. Um, and they actually are going to be featured um, one of the days in the uh, uh, virtual eco fair, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. So I've also included um, a couple of resources books by Doug Calame. Um, that's who I will be talking about a great deal this evening. And he, he really opened a lot of people's eyes. He's an entomologist, and he opened a lot of people's eyes to why we may want to consider planting natives. Um, as a Rutgers uh, Cooperative Extension, it's my job to educate, not advocate. So by all means, I'm certainly not, you know, um, trying to offend anyone by, by some plants that you might have in your yard that aren't native. It would be really nice to see the next ones that go into your yard have that native consideration. And we'll, we'll talk about that more tonight. I do have one question. Someone's mm -hmm. asking, um, how would you catch a butterfly to tag it? Um, just a second. If you go on Monarch Watch, there is a video, and they will show you, and there is actually a particular um, net that they recommend, which I bought, and you have to make sure that they're resting on the flower. You quietly go up behind them, be really quick, and you scoop them up into the back part. Um, I'm going to tell you that that takes some practice, and I'm right. not I'm not great at at doing that just yet. But I've been out there practicing it because I have all these wonderful, wonderful tags <laughs> that I've got to put on butterflies at some point. So if you drive past the Extension Center and you see me running around in the pollinator garden, um, yeah. you know, that's just Pam Bam Pam. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody does um, put together their garden to become a tagging station or an away station, is there a place that they should go to register that as a way station? 
do does someone come out and and certify that it is how how does that process go actually you go on monarchwatch.org and they have a questionnaire and you fill that out no one comes out to check on you you know you just fill out the questionnaire i will tell you there's a cost involved i can't remember how much it was off the top of my head and there's also an additional cost if you decide you want to tag mm. um so you know just saying that there there is a cost involved with it um i felt that that cost was very much worthwhile uh for us to um invest in sure. especially considering the scientific work that they do so. yeah absolutely well thank you so much this has been incredibly informative and i know marcy is going to give us some information to help wrap us up for this morning thanks pam oh thank you well, great, and thank you so much, Pam. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I actually have a question um, because uh, I do know, you know, Wheaton Arts has such a great relationship with the Master Gardeners, and I just wanted to know if you wanted to say anything about that, um, about volunteering, or um, who is eligible to volunteer for the Master Gardeners when things yeah, and I didn't say a whole lot of that because um, right now it, it, it's been determined that um, the Master Gardeners or any volunteers through Rutgers um, will not be meeting one-on-one -on -one until at least the end of the fall semester. However, if people decide that they would like to be involved with the Master Gardener program, it is a volunteer program. You commit to 60 hours of training. So there's a lot of time commitment here. Um, we're, we're looking into hybrid training for the future, both online and, in, and some in person, and hoping that that works well. And then there's also a commitment to um, volunteering. I can tell you that so many of the master gardeners do a lot of their volunteer time um, the day of and the days prior to the eco fair, so it's an eco fair is an important um, an important event for us because of the propagation team and all the other teams we've talked about the monarch team, you know. Um, so I can't really tell you exactly when things. No, nobody can make plans right now, so I can't tell you exactly when things are going to be offered again. Um, but uh, yeah, by all means, if you're if people are interested, um, please feel free to give them my um, email address and contact me. And that way, you know, I can I can start a dialogue with them. Great, and I'm going to do that in just a moment. <clears throat> and I have um, put all those um, to, um, links in to the chat as you have been instructing me all along. And as a matter of fact, I put all the, the all the links from the last side in the work <laughs> and as i said we will um be able to provide all that information for you um if anybody um just wants to wait for the download you can email me at mpeterson at wheatenarts.org but we're also asking you to let us know what other programs you'd like to see uh, wheat arts produce in the veins that of this eco week um in, in other veins but th this eco week is a good example of an a nice variety of the resources um, of people and the interest and the different interests that um, we can develop those programs on and it's it, it, it's truly been so exciting and Pam your presentation was wonderful and I'm gonna start making my list for <laughs> my garden um, because I've only got a few things out there that on your on your list, um, including the native grasses and some ferns too, that mm -hmm. I got from the master gardeners. Good. So before I share your information, um, your your contact information, I just wanted to remind everybody again, as I mentioned earlier, that there is that 15% off discount in the shopping cart now, along with the free eco bag and remind everybody that you can always feel really good about purchasing at Wheaton Arts, not just are you supporting Wheaton Arts, but you are supporting <clears throat> the artists that are making the works and and that's our resident artists and other artists that we represent. Um, so without further ado, here are the email addresses for Pamela Burton, 
at um, Rutgers, Cooperative Extension, and Pamela Wakeman at Wheaton Arts. So I thank everyone again, and we will look forward to seeing some of you through the week. And any final words, Pam and Pam? I just thank you for joining. Sure. Yep, thank you. And I want to make sure everybody knows and is feeling invited to join us at 6 p.m., both me and Pam, so we can talk about native plants. Wonderful. All right, I'll, I'll see you guys at 6. See you at 6. Bye now. See you at 6. Bye. Bye.